Well, let's begin with the big story, which is the green hydrogen policy that has been unveiled today. So, hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen involves using the electrolysis process with renewable energy to create um, uh, this kind of uh, uh, energy to power uh, the electricity that we require. So, the government today announced that policy, reiterating that this fuel will power the future. Let's first listen in to what the minister, power minister, said when speaking exclusively to ET now. We provided that, you know, they can get connected, they will get connectivity on priority. We've also provided that they can get connected straight away hmm. to the ICS. So, all this will make, uh, you know, the operations and setting up capacity simpler. Uh, in the uh, in, in order to make sure that uh, the e there is ease of doing business, we are providing for a centralized portal uh, okay. with the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, hmm. so that any application for connectivity can be filed there. Any application for open access hmm. uh, can be filed there, uh, so that uh, the, you know they don't have to run from one office to another and once it is filed it will be pursued by the ministry and it will be made sure that all the permissions are made available within the time limit specified in this okay sir uh, you have mentioned that you know uh, the manufacturers can purchase elect uh, renewable energy through exchanges so will there be an provision uh, for them that they can sell their uh, hydrogen uh, green hydrogen through exchanges no, we have not provided for that in the exchange as yet. This exchange is only for electricity. Mm. For green hydrogen, there is already an emerging market. Mm. And this emerging market is huge. Mm. Uh, you know, the, we see demand emerging uh, from all over Europe and Japan, etc. And this demand will only multiply because uh, all the developed countries have gotten to net zero, have given net zero targets. Now, in order to meet net zero targets, mm. they'll need green hydrogen and green ammonia. And what better place to procure it from than India? And what exactly is green hydrogen? What uh, have we learned uh, about what this process will do? Let's take a look. Green hydrogen is being called the fuel of the future. But how is it different from other types of hydrogen which have been color coded as gray and pink? You probably studied this in school. Hydrogen doesn't exist by itself in the Earth's atmosphere. It is highly reactive and binds itself to other elements. It is most commonly found in the molecule that covers over two thirds of the Earth's surface in H2O or water. The easiest way to derive hydrogen therefore is to split water molecules. This is done through a process called electrolysis. Now green hydrogen is green because the electrolysis is powered by renewable energy. Whereas grey hydrogen is derived using conventional power sources and pink is derived from nuclear power. The buzz around hydrogen as an alternative to fossil fuel is because of what happens when it is burnt. When you burn fossil fuel, it produces greenhouse gases in the form of emissions and this, as you know, has resulted in global warming. Hydrogen, on the other hand, when burnt, reacts with oxygen and forms H2O. And that's why it is considered the most sustainable and cleanest source of energy. Now, you're probably wondering if it is so good for the environment, why hasn't the world already adopted green hydrogen to run cars and factories? The answer to this is the high cost of production. No single country has been able to develop technology which can make green hydrogen economical as a fuel source. The big challenge with hydrogen is its reactive nature. It must be stored in liquid form at minus 253 degrees Celsius. And this would require special containers and cooling technology. But this hasn't stopped companies from trying to produce green hydrogen. In fact, Indian Oil Corporation is building the country's first green hydrogen plant at its Mathura refinery. Reliance Industries too is betting on green hydrogen in the next phase of development in Jamnagar. If India manages to create an ecosystem to produce green hydrogen on a large scale, it will prove to be clean, safe and economical for the future. It will not only reduce the dependence on fuel like petrol and diesel as well as coal, but will also help reduce carbon emissions. 
but to become a mainstream source of energy, the enabling infrastructure must be built. Bureau Report, ET Now. To speak more on this, I'm joined today by Gaurav Moda, partner and energy leader at uh, EY. R.R. Rashmi, distinguished fellow and program director, Earth Science and Climate Change, is joining us. Mayang Bansal, chief commercial officer of Renew Power, also with us on the show. So, uh, welcome to all of you and thank you so much for joining us today on the India Development Debate. Let me go across to Gaurav first. Gaurav, um, is there enough in what we're seeing so far in the policy to really make a difference? I mean, hydrogen as a source of clean energy has not been the most popular because of the high costs involved with it. Uh, does the policy or what we've seen of it so far address this basic issue? I think the, the policy is a clear and strong commitment from the government to make this whole hydrogen economy happen from India perspective. So it clearly outlines some very, very critical steps in providing for transmission, land banks and storage. So it's a clearly very strong start. Whether it is enough will depend upon the implementation and interpretation of the policy to make sure there's enough uh, incentives behind it as the phase two of the policy comes in. Two is the crucial part. Let me actually take that question to Mayang Bansal um, about whether this policy moves the needle. Now, I know uh, companies like yours have been waiting for a while for the policy to be unveiled, to be put into practice. What are the next steps and does this make a real change? Uh, you know, so I think I think it's a very progressive step. Uh, you know, I think uh, I would echo what Gaurav was saying earlier, which is that you know you have to see the intent behind this. Firstly, right, the intent is uh, we've clearly taken the lead uh, in renewable power so far. We've got 200 gigawatts uh, last year. Uh, now this is actually a segue for renewable energy to enter uh, the wider energy ecosystem. And uh, it really stresses the government's push on the decarbonization agenda. Now, whether you know it is enough or not, uh, I think you know ISTS waiver is a big step forward for for green hydrogen. It actually reduces green hydrogen costs significantly by almost 25 to 30 percent. Uh, so that I think is a very big step. And more importantly, as as I think you were you were earlier narrating, the storage and transportation of uh, green hydrogen is very difficult. Uh, now, with this, what it enables is for green hydrogen to be produced in a in a in a de uh, decentralized manner and it can be produced where it is required because the ISTS uh, availability because of availability of ISTS waiver. So that is actually a very, a very big game changer in my mind. So uh, the transmission fees being waived for 25 years is a big step. Uh, says renew power. Let me come to uh, RR Rashmi. Um, in terms of environmental impact, and India has this big goal that we have declared at COP26, we want to cut our emissions. We have placed our bet, among other things, on green hydrogen. Do you think that this is the right path and does the policy do enough? Certainly, this is a very good step. It, this uh, has been uh, pending for quite some time and it's uh, really a positive step that the government has taken. But I must uh, uh, emphasize that green hydrogen is not the uh, panacea for decarbonization of economy uh, as a whole. Uh, it's critical for industrial decarbonization. You know, as far as the electricity sector is concerned, currently we are relying on low uh, cost uh, solar energy. And that's going to um, transform the entire energy system over a period of time. So that will uh, keep on. I mean, the penetration of renewable energy has to rise in the electricity generation. That is the first step. And it's still, we are at about 105 megawatts, whereas we have to set up 500 megawatts by 2030. And maybe for decarbonization of the entire economy and reaching the net zero goal, we have to do much more than that. So that is uh, about electricity generation. But where the role of hydrogen comes in is in the decarbonization of industries, which are hard to abate sectors. You know, like steel, cement, uh, long distance trucking, or uh, uh, long term energy storage, you know, because the solar and the wind power is variable. And uh, so that variability can be addressed to a certain extent by the existing coal fired uh, power plants or other by, uh, hydro electric plants. But in, over a long term, over a, in a very long term, uh, it 
I think we need to rely on uh, green hydrogen to be able to store, but there uh, comes the problem of storage, distribution, transportation, mm -hmm. which uh, Mr. Bansal was talking about. But so uh, the green hydrogen is extremely important uh, for uh, the future of our decarbonization plans. We have to move towards net zero, uh, but we are most, uh, uh, but this will at this stage be able to address only about 25% of our total emissions. 75% of the other emissions in the economy arise from electricity uh, consumption, production, uh, and use of energy in different sectors. So that is what we need to uh, address immediately. But certainly we need to prepare because we can't wait for our emissions to peak uh, uh, and, and then start uh, looking at hydrogen as an option. We must uh, do that now in parallel. And uh, so that is why uh, the, this policy is welcome, but it only addresses the cost of renewables. But uh, the, when we think of reducing the cost of green hydrogen, we will have to think of other things. You know, uh, the, the cost of electrolyzers, the, the solar uh, 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 panels which have been manufactured. No, and, and, and are, you using, are you using clean fuel, are you using renewable fuel to create that green hydrogen? You know, let me come back to you, Mayank, on some of those issues because you broadly said very good policy step in the right direction. Uh, but does it reduce the timeline to actually making green hydrogen a viable alternative for industry to use? So, uh, you know, I would like to remind everybody that, you know, even today, by the way, from a power sector point of view, from an electricity point of view, renewable electricity is right now, in fact, very competitive vis-a-vis -vis any other form of electricity, right? So that's that's a given. Now, when you look at uh, hydrogen and alternate sources of production of hydrogen, it is largely uh, produced from LNG. And it is produced from uh, an SMR process using LNG. Now, firstly, obviously, LNG is imported. Secondly, the LNGs, uh, we've, we've all seen LNGs, uh, the, the price volatility that we've seen in, uh, in the recent times on LNG. So in fact, uh, you know, I, I believe very strongly and you know, we as a company believe very strongly that uh, uh, green hydrogen can be very competitive vis-a-vis -a, -vis a gray hydrogen option, uh, even, even today. Uh, and with these kind of incentives that the government is trying to put in place, that should be even better. Uh, now, on the electrolyzer front also, for example, I'd like to call out the second important factor that this policy captures, which is the banking. Right? Banking really helps uh, make sure that we are effectively utilizing the capital cost that we'll invest in electrolyzer more effectively, because instead of driving it with just solar power for eight hours, we will actually end up using the equipment for 24 hours with banked renewable energy, which the policy also provides for. Now that's another very significant step in redu reducing the cost of uh, green hydrogen. So I think in various applications, and you know, uh, uh, we were talking about that in terms of different use cases. For different use cases, the break-even between renewable green hydrogen versus gray hydrogen would be at different points. Yeah. But very clearly, there will be at least two or three use cases. For example, I can definitely think of refining as the first use case that will get. Uh, that will definitely uh, where uh, green hydrogen will be competitive vis-a-vis -vis gray hydrogen. Mm. Um, Gaurav, you know, your inputs on this, and if you look at some of the things that the uh, policy talks about today, it also talks about uh, these uh, bases being given connect priority in connectivity to grids. They're talking about manufacturing zones for the creation of green hydrogen. Uh, they're talking about storage facilities and next to uh, ports. Uh, do you think that these are enough to actually push companies to come and start producing green hydrogen in a larger fashion? I would like to believe so. I mean, if you look at the land bank availability that government is making available, as well as transmission and other initiatives in the policy, all of these are essentially towards not just uh, filling in the gap in terms of financial feasibility, but also enabling large corporations as well as PSUs to come in and set up shop, not just local players, but also global players. A lot of this that we're discussing is more on the supply side of green hydrogen and making it economically viable. But if you look at the effect of what hydrogen can have on the Indian economy, in the short term, it may still be replacing some of the gas and coal requirement on the commercial industrial side. But the big potential, if you look at it, is essentially to potentially replace diesel in trucks. 
if you look at the overall transportation fuel of the country, almost 50 to 55 percent is diesel. And most of that goes into long haul trucks, short haul trucks, which move across the country. Now, imagine a situation where the fuel cell technology develops enough in the next two, three, four, five years. And we use green hydrogen to replace a good amount of the diesel, which is more than half of the consumption in India, with potentially fuel cell, uh, hydrogen led fuel cells. And imagine the kind of emission reduction and greener future that we create for the country. So I think that's the potential this policy is trying to push for. Hmm. Um, you know, Ara Rashmi, you talked about how green hydrogen is just a part of the puzzle. And to truly uh, improve our track record on emissions, we have to do a lot more. Do you see that simultaneous policy push coming through? Yeah, I think in due course this might happen uh, because the, the missing piece here in this entire uh, drive towards green hydrogen is the demand side. Uh, as, as Mr. Gaurav was talking about, we are talking about supply side costs at the moment, trying to bring down the cost of producing green hydrogen. But, but if for a sustainable uh, transformation, we need to also create a demand for green hydrogen. And that demand has to come basically in the four sectors. One is the, the industries, the, the hard to abate industries like steel and cement. The other is the long distance transport, long distance trucking and uh, uh, passenger transport. The, the, the other one is uh, energy storage because the, the variable energy, which is which going to be produced in the solar and the wind uh, through uh, wind power, uh, that has to be stored to be able to you know, uh, overcome the grid uh, integration problems of this variable energy. So, so these are the key sectors and we have to create a demand. How does this demand get created? Unless the costs come down and become affordable for the industry. So industry will not normally go for these high cost options on its own. So there has to be a regulatory support Maybe there has to be some mandatory demand. You know, uh, uh, some refineries, for example, uh, I understand that they have been uh, given a task to produce at least 500 percent of the total uh, refineries. The total production has to be in form of uh, hydrogen, green hydrogen or grey hydrogen. So, so the so the the puzzle will uh, fit in place if we are uh, going to address both the demand side as well as the supply side. Absolutely, uh, but it's and a see, start. Uh, yes. And see, that is where you we need to look at this policy as really a very, very strong push mm. from the reg regulatory and government side. And at the end of the day, the Indian entrepreneur is not dependent upon just policy. They oh. want the comfort that yes, policy and enabling environment is behind them. Then they go all out, as, we, as we've seen in several sectors in the last two, three decades. That's what this policy is doing. It's, providing the enabling environment, doing a few right things, and then the Indian entrepreneur takes over from there. Okay, let's hope that's what uh, happens, uh, that the Indian entrepreneur is geared up. And uh, I, I must say that the majors are coming into this uh, from Reliance to others have all now planned their green hydrogen push. So uh, perhaps this will be a reality faster than uh, we expect. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us uh, on this very important discussion to understand what this policy really does and whether it moves the needle. So it is definitely a start, but more will be clear when phase two of the policy is actually put out and that will happen after it's cleared from cabinet. Now another important story, the